Cool. All right. So welcome everybody to episode two of Marine Science with Mermaid Mo. Um, I'm Madeline or Mermaid Mo. Um, and I am one of the instructors here at Kona Honu Divers. Um, been diving for a while. <laughs> um, and I actually just finished up yesterday my undergraduate degree in marine science. So um, I am brand new. Thank you. Um, so I am now qualified. <laughs> um, so my whole thing is I know some of you might have been on last week, but my whole thing is I love the ocean and I love talking about the ocean and I love sharing um, the information that I have um, so that hopefully I can inspire other people to love the ocean as well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite aspects, um, one of my favorite um, groups of animals that are in the ocean. And that's going to be marine mammals. So give me just a second and I will share my screen um, so that you can see what I got going on. Okay, so we're going to be talking about marine mammals. Um, so this is kind of a really huge classification, um, really huge grouping of animals. Um, <clears throat> so there is kind of a lot to talk about, um, but I'm going to have it condensed really tightly into a nutshell. Um, this is something that, um, you know, can go for the course of an entire semester and you can talk about all the marine mammals for an entire semester. And a lot of the individual groups and things that we're talking about can even be expanded more into an entire lecture or two. Um, so this is just kind of the nuts and bolts, the general information about marine mammals. Um, and then if there are any more specific questions about specific animals, we can definitely delve into that a little bit um, time pending. <laughs> All right. Um, so why is this not working? So we're gonna start off with the definition of a marine mammal. Um, so it is any mammal that lives and hunts either in or near the marine environment. Um, so the animal doesn't necessarily have to live inside the ocean to be considered a marine mammal. It could live near the, near the ocean, but still heavily rely on it. Um, so I think one of the most obvious marine mammals is a whale. Right, we have a great graphic of a sperm whale right here. Um, you know, whales are probably when anybody thinks of a marine mammal, I'm pretty sure they think of a whale, right? Um, another one is a seal, super adorable. Um, again, another animal that people tend to think of when they think of a marine mammal. Um, so yeah, the thing, but the difference between the seals and the whales is the whales spend their entire life in the ocean, whereas seals do not. Um, they spend a vast majority of their life in the ocean, but they still come up on land to rest and to sleep and things like that. All right, then we have a sea lion. This guy's kind of a little grumpy old man picture. Makes me laugh every time I look at it. Um, yeah, so sea lion. Most people don't realize that sea lions and seals are quite different. Um, and we are going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on here in this webinar. Um, yeah, so sea lion. And then somebody who doesn't know which one he wants to be more like the seal or the sea lion, we have a walrus. Um, that is a marine mammal. Um, and then there is a cute little otter. Look at that face. <laughs> I love it so much. Uh, yeah, so sea otters. And then there's one more marine mammal that most people don't think of as being a marine mammal. Um, most of them, most people think that they're just a mainly terrestrial animal. Um, what do we got? What do we got? Chat. Polar bears. Exactly, Oren. We got our polar bears. Um, so polar bears are indeed a marine mammal. So they do rely heavily on the marine environment 
Um, they spend quite a lot of time in the ocean, uh, but they don't necessarily spend their entire life in the ocean. Okay, awesome. So they're gonna be the first ones that we talk about today. It's polar bears. Uh, polar bears are really awesome. Um, they are in uh, the family Ursidae, um, so the same as all the other terrestrial bears. Um, so polar bears are a descendant, direct descendant of the brown bear. There's a theory out there saying that um, polar bears are just evolved versions of the brown bear. Um, so back when there was that land bridge between Russia and, um, and North America, um, they, there's a theory stating that, you know, that group of brown bears that was up there somehow got trapped when the land bridge disappeared and was forced to, um, was forced to adapt and evolve to the harsh um, Arctic environment, right? So they live in the Arctic, in the ice, in the cold. Um, they are the largest of all of the bear species. Uh, they do have a little bit more of an, um, an adaptation to the cold environment and to living in and on the ice. Um, so unlike most bears, they don't have the withers hump right here up at their shoulder blades. Um, they have a little bit of a longer neck, a little bit smaller ears, and they have huge paws, which we're going to look at right now. <laughs> so polar bear paws are huge and they're probably one of the most important adaptations that they have. Um, to give you some perspective, this is a human hand compared to a polar bear paw. Um, so huge, huge paws. Um, their paws are partially webbed, which is what they use to help them swim. Um, they're not the greatest swimmers of all the marine mammals, uh, but they are better than most terrestrial animals. Um, so in terms of terrestrial animals, they're fantastic swimmers. They're really great. Uh, but in terms of marine mammals and marine animals in general, they're probably the poorest swimmers out of the bunch. Um, so they use those big paws kind of like paddles or oars to get them through the water. Um, and their little um, toesies, their little, um, yeah, their little toes, their little digits, they are partially webbed. So that helps them to kind of pull the water a little bit better. Additionally, these paws do work as kind of a snowshoe to help evenly distribute the weight out on the ice so that they don't just fall through because these are huge critters. Um, they are big animals and they weigh a lot. Um, so they need to, um, you know, not be falling through the ice because of their, because of their sheer weight. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, that's what they use those paws for. Um, they do have semi-retractable claws, so those claws can come out when they need them, when they are hunting. Uh, yeah, and those, those are polar bear paws. All right, so the next animal we're going to talk about are sea otters. Um, they're in the order Mustelidae um, in Carnivora. Um, so sea otters, some of you may know this, but they do have the densest fur of any mammal on earth. Um, and that's how they keep themselves warm. Unlike other marine mammals, they do not rely on a thick blubber layer or any blubber at all to keep them warm. It is simply just their fur. Um, their fur is so dense that they actually spend most of their time throughout the day um, grooming their fur and fluffing it and making sure that it maintains that thermal property. Um, so how their fur works and how it keeps them warm is essentially it traps air in between um, the individual hairs, uh, the little, little bits of fur. Um, and that air is what keeps the otter warm. So it's kind of like a wetsuit where you get water in it, you know, it holds it up against your body, it warms up, and that water keeps your, keeps your body relatively warm underneath that neoprene. It's kind of the same thing with sea otter fur, except for it's just using air. Um, so it traps, you know, little pockets of air in their fur. That's why they fluff it so much, um, and they groom their fur. So they are continually putting air in their fur to help 
keep their body warm. Um, and they are primarily a coastal animal. Um, you mostly will see them, you know, in like the Pacific Northwest, up and down the coast of California, all the way up Oregon, Washington, Canada, up into um, Alaska. So that entire um, west coast of North America. Um, sea otters, fun fact about them that I really love is that um, they don't really spend too much time on land. They actually do sleep in the water. Uh, it's not necessarily underwater though. Um, they do live in relatively large communities and they are social creatures. And so when they sleep, they actually hold hands, which is really adorable. So here in this photo, um, these otters are sleeping and they are holding hands and they create a raft um, with the other otters in their community so that they don't drift away from each other. Uh, particularly when it's like a mother and a pup, um, they really hold hands um, and they just like to stay nice and close, which I think is really stinking cute. Um, sea otters primarily feed on sea urchins. So this guy, um, he has five urchins, four on his belly, one he's um, diving into. Um, and they are really quite um, innovative. They do use rocks and things like that to bust open the test, the hard outer layer of the sea urchin so that they can get inside the good soft meat on the inside. Um, they also eat clams and things like that in the same kind of way. Um, so this is a little sea otter eating some urchin. Now most people don't really think of sea otters as being something particularly important, just kind of as a cute little fluff ball who hangs out in the water, right? Um, but in reality, they are a keystone species, meaning that they are super, super important to the kelp forest environment and to the kelp forest ecosystem. So here we have kind of a little mini food web. So we have our primary producers down here um, being the kelp, right? All the sea kelp, like what you would think of out in Monterey Bay in California, right? Um, so then what eats the kelp? What is the kelp fuel? It fuels these purple sea urchins, right? So the purple sea urchins eat the kelp and then the sea otters eat the purple sea urchins. Okay, so relatively simple, basic, short little food web. Um, this is the main, main flow of it. Um, and most people didn't really think of that as being something that could be disturbed or um, you know, if one of these creatures were taken out of the equation, it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. But it actually turns out that it is. So sea otters are a keystone species. They are really, really important for managing the health of the overall ecosystem. Um, because the sea otters regulate the sea urchins, right? Um, so the sea urchins eat the kelp, right? And if nobody's regulating the sea urchins, nobody's eating the sea urchins, and the urchins are just going to go ham on the kelp and eat all of the kelp and completely wipe out um, entire kelp forests, right? Um, so the entire kelp, all these trees, all these underwater trees will disappear, right? Um, yeah, and they are absolutely Orin. Um, they are disappearing. Um, and, you know, just the same too. So if all of these urchins were to disappear, if there was a huge influx of sea otters and all the urchins were to disappear, then the kelp is going to just go rampant, right? And it's going to totally take over that entire area. And that's going to be all that you ever see. Okay, so, and then obviously if the primary producers go away, then the entire system goes away. They're the base level of that food web. So what is happening right now is there has been another animal that has been added to this food web, particularly in Monterey Bay, and that's the orca, right? The killer whale. So the killer whale has started to feed on the sea otters. 
So that is almost completely taken away the sea otters from this food web, okay? Um, so what has happened is because those sea otters have disappeared, the urchins have gone rampant. There's been a ton of urchins that are going all over the place and they have completely destroyed the kelp forest, um, causing pretty much the entire ecosystem to collapse. Um, there's a lot of theories out there as to why the orcas decided to somehow start feeding on sea otters. Um, it doesn't necessarily make sense because there's not a whole lot of nutritional content or value to them, um, mostly because they're primarily fluff, <laughs> not a whole lot of caloric um, intake for those orcas, but they have started to feed on the sea otters. Um, one of the theories is that there's been a collapse in the stellar sea lion population up in the north north part of the west coast, um, causing them to go further south and look for a different kind of food to eat and finding the sea otters and settling on that. So the sea otters are super, super important in this entire ecosystem. Um, and because the orcas have decided to start eating them, the otters have, you know, started to disappear and started to dwindle, allowing the urchins to rise up and um, <clears throat> causing the kelp forests to disappear. So, yeah. Okay, so now we're going to talk about pinnipeds. Um, this is a group of animals. Uh, pinniped means feather footed. All right. So their feet kind of look like feathers, as you can kind of see in this lovely little seal up here on the top. Chat. Yeah, so Orin just asked um, if a lot of the problem in the kelp forest was the withering disease um, that took out the sunflower stars and also fed upon the urchins. Yeah, so that definitely is another issue. Um, that is another um, aspect of it. Um, you know, the entire decline of the kelp forest is a huge complicated mess, ultimately, um, and the decline of many other ecosystems as well. Um, and there's a lot of different factors that play into it. So I was just trying to highlight, you know, how important the sea otter alone is in that, um, in that trophic food web, in that trophic scale. Yeah, but yes, definitely the withering disease um, is definitely playing a part in the, um, in the decline of the kelp forest as well. All right, feather footed. Pinnipeds, all right? So this includes the seals, sea lions, and walruses, all right? So up here, we have a spotted seal. Down here, we have a um, California sea lion. And then here in the middle, which kind of just describes them on a taxonomic level, um, is the walrus, okay? So the first thing that we're going to discuss is the difference between a seal and a sea lion. A lot, a lot of people get this confused. Um, I've heard numerous people call a sea lion a seal. Um, they just think that everybody's a seal, typically speaking. Um, so the easiest way to tell the difference between the two is to first look at their head. Um, you want to look for ears. So the sea lion has a cute little ear flap right here, um, whereas a seal does not. A seal just has a little pinprick hole in his head, um, and that's his ear. Um, but other than that, there's no external ear flap or anything like that that suggests that that is its ear. Okay, then the next thing is sea lions have very strong pectoral muscles, all right? And they have very sturdy front flippers. And um, they have long hairless fore flippers. And so with those strong, sturdy, long flippers, they're able to push themselves up and engage those pectoral muscles. And that allows them to put themselves pretty much upright. Whereas seals don't have that. Their pectoral muscles are very, very weak. Um, they can't really lift themselves up. 
Um, and they have short, stubby, hairy fore flippers. Okay. Um, they do have claws on their fore flippers that they use to grab onto the ice and to help pull themselves along. Uh, but they cannot push themselves up um, and lift their heads up. Okay. And then we're going to look at the hind flippers. All right. So sea lions, uh, they can rotate their hind flippers and actually bring them up underneath themselves. Um, and they can actually do like a walking motion. Um, but seals, um, they can't rotate those hind flippers. They are angled backwards. Um, there's also quite a difference in locomotion, not just on land, but also in the water between seals and sea lions. Um, seals rely on these hind flippers um, to do kind of a back and forth motion like this. I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, so they use their hind flippers to kind of go like this and push themselves to the water. So they do not rely on these four flippers at all for water locomotion. Whereas a sea lion, because they have those long four flippers, they are strong, they are sturdy, they do more of a flapping motion through the water. They don't really rely on those, um, they do not rely on those hind flippers. You can see only my screen, okay. Um, they do not rely on those hind flippers to um, propel themselves to the water at all. They just do a flapping motion with their front flippers. Okay, and then there's a walrus. <laughs> uh, is, is really weird um, taxonomically speaking, anatomically. Um, they are bigger and thicker, much like the, um, much like the seals, right? Um, but they can kind of, but they do have relatively strong pectoral muscles, so they can kind of push themselves up, um, when they're on land, kind of like the sea lion, but their fore flippers are a little bit shorter, um, and they can't quite bring their hind flippers underneath their body. You know, they're more, the hind flippers are more along the lines of a seal. Um, also, they don't have ear flaps. <laughs> um, so they're, they're different. They're um, kind of like a seal, but also kind of like a sea lion. Um, and there's a lot of debate in the literature going back and forth about the taxonomic ranking um, and the classification of um, walruses or the otobenids, um, which is what we call them, um, just because it, we don't know what happened. <laughs> it's like a seal and a sea lion kind of got together and this is the love child between that seal and the sea lion. Okay. Okay. So now we are going to hopefully be able to watch a short little clip um, of seals and sea lions moving on land. So this first one is going to be a seal. Um, you're going to notice that they kind of do a motion that looks like the break dance move the wave. All right. Um, can you guys see, you guys can still see the screen, I'm hoping. Um, so it's kind of like a little blub, blub, blub motion, right? Um, so what they do is they lift their front end up as much as they can, lurch it forward and create kind of an undulated um, wave motion like you would think of when you're trying to do um, the break, the worm break dance, right? Um, this motion actually has a scientific name. Um, it is called galumphing. Um, so these seals are galumphing. That is how they move on land. Um, <clears throat> so they use those claws when they are galumphing, typically in the Arctic species or in the seals that are on the ice. They typically use those claws to grab onto the ice to be able to lurch themselves forward um, so that they can get that galumphing motion started. All right, and then here is our lovely sea lion. It's 
going to be quite a different motion. Um, so as you can see, you're going to see that he can pull his hind flippers kind of up underneath him. And it's like a little walking waddling motion. Uh, sea lions can actually move really pretty fast on land. Um, oh, you're not seeing the video. Okay. Were you guys able to see the previous video? No. Okay. Well, then that didn't work the way that I wanted it to. Um, let me try something really quickly. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, so this is the sea lion walking. It's kind of choppy. Okay. Um, you can see he's push. Can you see that he's pushing himself up and he can bring those hind flippers underneath him to walk. Yeah, cool. All right. Awesome. So yeah, that is our sea lion walking. Um, I really want to show you the, um, Now I want to show you the seal because that one um, is kind of hard to show. All right, here's the seal moving. I'm going to rewind it real quick. All right, so there's, there's the seal moving. So he kind of lifts the front end of his body up, lurches it forward, and then kind of does the um, <laughs> the wave or the, um, the worm motion to move himself forward. Um, in the species that live in the icy environments, it kind of does look like claymation. Um, in the species that live in the, um, icy environments, they, um, they use the claws on their fore flippers to grab into the ice to pull themselves forward and lurch themselves forward and start that wave worm motion. So that is those guys. Okay. I swear I know how to use Zoom guys, I promise. <laughs> All right, cool. So those are the seals and the sea lions. Uh, the walruses, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what they use their tusks for. Um, so they do use it for fighting, um, primarily when they are fighting over females or when they're fighting over territory. Um, but they primarily use it for feeding, which is what this guy is doing right here. Um, so they use it, use their tusks as kind of a sled um, to run along the bottom of the ocean. And then they use those, um, those lips and their whiskers to kind of fan away the, the sand and the gravel and the muck in order to get to the clams that they are eating and the little benthic um, critters that they're eating. So mostly clams. All right. Okay. Now we are moving into possibly my favorite group of animals, which are the cetaceans. All right. These are our whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Okay, probably the most charismatic of all of the marine mammals or all of the marine animals in general. Um, they have quite a high diversity. Uh, there are a lot of them, uh, but they are mostly classified into two specific groups. So the first one is Mysticeti or the baleen whales. Okay, um, so these guys, instead of having teeth, they have baleen, which is a keratin-like substance in their mouth that they use to filter their food out of the water. All right, so this is what it looks like. Um, kind of looks like a bristle brush or, um, you know, like the end of your broom, right? And it kind of functions a little bit the same way. So most of these whales, what they'll do is they'll take in a huge heaping gulp full of water, close their mouth, and push the water out. 
and the water goes in between all the individual tiny spaces between the baleen right over here um goes pretty much the water filters out of the baleen and it leaves all of the animals that they're trying to eat on the inside of their mouth okay um <clears throat> so one of the first ones that we um think of typically being out here in hawaii is the humpback whale um that's this guy here um they have a medium ground, medium length baleen. So it's not super long, but it's also not short and stubby. Um, you'll notice that it's shorter in the front of his mouth and then, you know, gets longer towards the back. Um, and these guys eat krill. So the baleen in all of the mysticete whales mouths is specialized and more geared towards what they eat. So this baleen is geared towards eating krill, okay? Um, this is really good for catching these krill from in the water. Another really cool thing about humpbacks is they actually blow bubble nets. Um, they work in groups and pods and blow bubble nets. So they blow a ring around the krill that they're trying to eat, and then they come up from underneath, mouths gaping, and then when they breach the surface, they close their mouth and push all the water out, keeping the krill in their mouth, which is pretty, pretty ingenious. All right, next we have our gray whale. Um, this is what he looks like. This is not really the greatest image, um, but this is what his face looks like. And as you can see, he has very short stubby baleen. All right. <clears throat> It's very, um, it's short, it's stubby, it's dense, it's durable. And that's because gray whales are muck feeders. Um, they eat little amphipods, which are these guys over here. Um, and these amphipods mostly live in the muck, in the dirt, um, in the sediments at the bottom of the ocean. So gray whales mostly feed along the coast. They are another coastal species of whale. Um, and what they do is they swim along sideways with their mouths open kind of like this and kind of dig in the sand with their mouths, um, open and closing their mouth, getting sediment in and then pushing that sediment out through their baleen along with the water you know, revealing all of these co or these amphipods that are, um, that they're actually hunting for and that they're trying to eat. Okay. So that's those guys. And then we have whales like the right whale. Okay. These whales have super, super long baleen. Um, you know, it's not like the humpback um, where it's, you know, really short here and then it gets a little bit longer as it goes to the back of the mouth. Um, all of the right whale's baleen are really pretty long. Um, and this baleen is geared towards eating copepods mostly. Um, baleen whale, or not baleen, right whales, excuse me, are uh, more passive feeders. So what they do is they just skim the surface of the water with their mouths open. Um, kind of like how a manta ray eats, um, but in whale form. Um, so they just kind of skim along the surface, just beneath the surface, um, get these copepods um, in their mouths and then filter the water out through their baleen. Uh, this baleen is a little bit more tightly packed than the other ones, a little bit of finer spaces in between uh, because the copepods are microscopic. They are really, really tiny. Um, so if there's, you know, too big of a gap in their baleen, um, <clears throat> then the, all of these copepods are gonna disappear and go out with the rest of the water as they are feeding. All right, now we're gonna talk about the, um, the next group of whales or the odontoceti whales. Um, these are the toothed whales. Remember this because odonto, like the orthodontist, means teeth. 
Um, so these whales have teeth. Um, believe it or not, dolphins and porpoises are considered to be whales as well. Um, <clears throat> so here in this slide, we have our good old, um, we have our bottlenose dolphin right over here, good old flipper, um, or the Triceops truncatus, as we call him in Latin. Is a scientific name. Then over here we have our orca whale or the Orsinus orca, free willy over here. Um, and then down here on the bottom we have the Pseudorca crassidens or the false killer whale. Okay. So these are some of the toothed whales that um, we have. These are some of the specifically the bottlenose dolphin and the orca. Those are the ones that most people think of. I feel like when we think of whales or dolphins, they're kind of the most charismatic out of this group. All right, so primarily the difference between baleen and toothed whales, the mysticeti and odontoceti. Um, there's quite a few differences. Um, typically, the baleen whales are a little bit larger than the odontoceti or the toothed whales. Um, the baleen whales, you know, have baleen and the uh, toothed whales have teeth. So that's a big difference in itself. Uh, there's a huge size difference. Um, when you're looking at the blowholes on these animals, um, the baleen whales tend to have two nostrils or two blowholes at the top of their head, whereas a toothed whale only has one. Um, another one is that uh, the dorsal fin on most baleen whales are really, really small or almost non-existent. Um, so, <coughs> It's almost not there in some species. In others, it's a little bit more pronounced. Whereas in the toothed whales, it is a relatively large, obvious dorsal fin. Okay. Uh, but probably one of the biggest, most important ones is the existence of a melon, which is this part right here. They're kind of big, bulbous forehead. Okay. Um, baleen whales do not have that. Um, the toothed whales use that melon for echolocation. Um, so only the toothed whales do echolocation, whereas the baleen whales do not do that. Okay. Um, so this is a diagram of the melon alongside the head of an orca whale um, to kind of see what it looks like on the inside and then also on the outside as well in real life. Um, so here you have your skull of the animal with his forehead, and this is the cranial space, right? And then there's this huge, like, fluid sack right here, his forehead, and that is the melon. So <clears throat> it is filled with um, kind of a milky-like substance um, that they use to amplify the echolocation. Um, so here's where they create the sound. So this is their blowhole right here. Um, so they use their blowhole in their lungs to create the sound and the clicks. And it goes through the melon, which amplifies it in sound waves going out like this. Um, then when it hits something, it turns around and comes back and they receive it through their jawbone and then back to this bone in the back of their skull. And then that's where they can process it and process the image um, and determine you know, lots of different factors about what they're looking at, direction, size, um, you know, different things. Okay. And this is an orca. So an orca is a toothed whale. He does have a melon right here. This would be his melon area. Uh, so that's where this little organ would be. Okay. So another whale that has a he huge melon is the sperm whale. This is the largest of the toothed whales. Um, his melon is absolutely ridiculously huge. So it would be this pretty much this entire section elongated portion of his snout. So here's where his blowhole is. 
Um, you know, here's his whole melon and then his cranium, his brain space would be back here and his jaws. Okay. Um, sperm whales actually get their name because of their melon and their melon fluid. So back in the day, whalers would go and go after these sperm whales. Um, they were really good to catch because they had a lot of that melon fluid. And that was what a lot of the whalers were going after. Um, that was whale oil. Um, just kidding. It wasn't the melon fluid that they were going after. It was the whale oil, right? Um, things that you get from like their blubber layer, um, you know, and different components of the animal's body. Um, but when they would haul these sperm whales up onto the deck of their whaling vessels, they would start to process them. They would cut open their head and they noticed that when they cut open the head, out came all of this white milky fluidy substance. Looks like sperm <laughs> for lack of a better term, right? Um, so that's where they got the name. Uh, they, the whalers actually thought that their melon fluid um, the stuff that came from their head up here was actually their sperm. So, you know, whalers coming up with these crazy tales and theories. Um, they thought that the testes of the whale were actually up here in its head. Um, and that when they cut open into the head, that was their sperm. Um, that's how they got the name sperm whale. Um, but that obviously since has been proven false. Uh, their testes are where their male gonads are where they're supposed to be um, internally though. Um, and that's actually just their melon that they cut into. What is really, really cool about sperm whales is we know that they dive really, really deep and that they quote, wrestle with giant squid. They really like to eat squid. So most sperm whales are gonna have scars all over their face, all over their nose area. Um, from trying to eat those squid. Um, so we've always thought about and questioned how do they dive so deep? And one of the things that we figured out is that sperm whales can actually control the density of that fluid inside of their melon. So there's lots of blood vessels that connect to it. Um, and so what they can do is they can restrict the blood flow to that area to cool down the fluid and make it more dense when they're ready to dive deep. So their head is nice and heavy. Um, so this area is nice and heavy and it can help pull them down to the bottom with less effort than just relying on their tail or their own body power, right? So they just make their forehead really dense and they do a head dive down to the bottom. Then when they're ready to come back up to make it a little bit easier, what they're gonna do is they're going to um, add blood flow or um, take off the restriction of blood flow, make that blood go back to um, their melon and it'll warm it up and it'll make it less dense so that it'll be easier for the whale to come back up to the surface. Which that is like my favorite fact about a sperm whale. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, really, really awesome stuff that they can do, um, really amazing adaptations. Um, Another thing to keep in mind that I feel like I probably should have said earlier is all of these mammals, all of these marine mammals, their breath, their, their breath holders, they breathe air. Um, so they don't have gills, they do have lungs. Um, so anytime we're talking about these whales diving to depths or going underwater to go hunt, or even, you know, our otters or sea lions are, um, seals, polar bears, um, walruses, all that kind of stuff. They all hold their breath when they're underwater. They have amazing um, adaptations to be able to hold their breath. So when they're going down to their depths, they just take one breath at the surface and then go down and come all the way back up. Um, so yeah, that's super, super crazy. Um, tying back into the sperm whales, that's when being able to control the density of the fluid in your melon is gonna come in handy, right? So you have one breath to get all the way down to the bottom to get your giant squid, to wrestle around with them and then come back up. You know, you want to be able to make it as easy as possible to get down and then get back up when you're all done. 
So that adaptation in itself with sperm whales is just incredible that they were able to figure that out and to do that. All right, now even within, um, even within the odontocetes, even within the toothed whales, um, there is a difference. Um, there is another separation, a little bit of a classification, and that is your dolphins and your porpoises. Most people think, oh, a dolphin and a porpoise is the same thing. Well, not, not quite. Um, they are very similar, but they are not quite the same. <clears throat> um, so, if you're out in the fields or out on the water, quick, easy way to tell the difference between a dolphin and a porpoise is to look, again, at its anatomy. Um, the easiest one is to look at his face. Okay, so here in this image is a Hawaiian spinner dolphin. And as you can see, he has a really long rostrum or a long beak. And then you can see his little melon here, okay? That's going to be the main difference, uh, the main way that you're going to tell the difference between a dolphin and a porpoise. Um, dolphins tend to have a longer rostrum, whereas a porpoise almost doesn't have a rostrum. It's really short and stubby, and he has a nice rounded head. Here's his melon. Um, you know, it's more rounded. Okay. And then the other way is you can look at the dorsal fin. So dolphins typically have a sharp point on their dorsal fin that kind of angles back, that's like a crescent moon. Um, that's not always necessarily um, the best way to tell the difference because sometimes the porpoises have a little bit of a point on their dorsal fin, but typically they are more rounded. So this dorsal fin is a little bit more rounded, whereas this one is a little bit more pointy. Uh, but probably the best way is to look at his teeth um, but if you're out in the field, the last thing that you want to see is one of these guys' teeth, right? You don't want to take the time to be like, open up, buddy, and look, and look in his mouth, okay? Um, so you're going to mostly just look at his head. So this is a porpoise. This is a harbor porpoise, um, and then the image on the left is a Hawaiian spinner dolphin which a really fun fact about Hawaiian spinner dolphins, which is really, really cool. Um, most of us already know that they, um, they go out and hunt during the night. So they are nocturnal hunters. Um, and then, so they're out in the open ocean, out in the plagic at night, hunting, feeding, um, most active at that time. And then during the day, they come into shallow bays and then the coastal area, uh, to rest. Um, so spinner dolphins are actually in fission fusion communities, meaning that one pod of spinner dolphins is never going to have the exact same individuals on Monday as it does on Friday. So they are constantly moving all around all over the place, um, all throughout the Hawaiian Islands pretty much. So they are constantly mixing around, going to different communities, things like that. So like, let's say this spinner dolphin here in this image, we're going to call him Timmy, right? So let's say Timmy's hanging out here in Kona. He's resting during the day in the Bay at Honokohau Harbor, you know, just hanging out. And then at night he decides, oh yeah, I'm going to go hunt. I'm going to go in like the channel between you know, Maui and Big Island. And then, you know, I think I'm going to move over to Maui and I'm going to hang out in Maui on Tuesday. Um, you know, just doing that, just moving around from community to community, pod to pod, he could end up all the way in Kauai or the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands even. Um, so huge, ever-changing um, populations and communities of spinner dolphins. All right, now for the very, very last group of marine mammals is the Cyrenians. These are the manatees and this uh, dugongs. All right, so Cyrenians, they got their Latin name, again, from whalers and old, um, old sailors. Um, siren being mermaids or sea sirens, right? Um, when they first spotted these sea cows, mostly these dugongs, um, which is this guy over here. 
Um, they thought it was a mermaid. <laughs> they thought that it was a maiden with long flowing hair and a tail. Um, so that's how they got the name Serenian. We have a chat comment. Yep. Um, so what they relatively quickly <laughs> realized was that they weren't actually fair maidens with long flowing hair. It was just these critters uh, swimming along through the seagrass beds and the seagrass made it look like they had hair um, and was kind of a fun little trick that they were pulling on the sailors. Um, so yeah, we have two animals in this classification. Uh, that is your manatee and your dugong. Um, they look quite similar, um, but they differ um, spatially. Um, so in where their habitats are and also anatomically as well. Um, so this guy over here on the left is a manatee and this guy on the right is a dugong. I call them the floaty, floaty sea potatoes of the ocean because manatees kind of look like a potato. <laughs> All right, so here's the main difference between serenians um, or the manatees and the dugongs. Um, typically speaking, the dugongs have a smooth skin, um, more along the lines of a whale or one of the cetaceans. Whereas a manatee has more rough skin, all right? Uh, you can also really see it in their face. Um, so the dugong has almost like an elongated snout, kind of, kind of reminds me of a walrus snout um, with, has the mu with his muzzle flared down towards the bottom, right? His nose, his nostrils are a little bit higher up on his face and his mouth is more benthically facing, more facing down towards the bottom. Whereas a manatee, he doesn't really have a flared snout or a muzzle, it's just kind of right here in the front of his face. Um, so it's, he's not really necessarily feeding benthic, his mouth is more pointed forwards than down, okay? rough skin uh, for the manatees, smooth skin for the dugongs. Uh, another one is the average weight. Um, so dugongs tend to weigh around 550 to 660 pounds, whereas a manatee is quite a bit heavier, almost double. Um, they tend to weigh around um, 1,200 pounds. Um, so that's another huge difference. Um, one of the most glaring obvious ones is his tail or the tails. Um, so a dugong has a fluke shaped tail like a whale. Um, whereas the manatee he has more of a paddle shaped tail. Uh, just different kinds of locomotion, uh, different kinds of speeds. Um, so the manatee, they kind of just cruise and kind of just float. So they just use that paddle to give them a little bit of a push so that they can cruise. Whereas a dugong, um, they tend to go quite a bit faster um, than a manatee does. Um, a little bit more go-go than the manatee. Okay. Um, and there's also a difference in what they eat. Um, so you can see in their mouths or in their muzzles, it's quite a bit different. Um, so the dugongs do mostly focus on feeding down on the bottom of the ground, um, whereas the manatees are more of grazers. Um, so while they do typically feed on the same kind of food, they feed on different parts of that food. So these Serenians, they feed on seagrass, right? Uh, but the manatees, they mostly just eat the leaves. So they're grazers. They are the sea cows. Um, so they graze along and eat the blades of the seagrass. Whereas the um, dugongs, they come along and they do have short little tusks in their mouths. Um, they use their downward facing um, flared muzzle um, to fan away the dirt and the sediment. And then they use those little itty bitty tusks to uproot the roots of the seagrass. So together, um, these two animals can live in the same ecosystem, in the same habitat, because uh, the manatees, they just 
go through, they eat the leaves, and then here come along the dugongs and they uproot the roots of those seagrasses. All right, and here's that, um, here's that motion. So here on the left side, this is your dugong. Um, he is using that paddle-shaped snout that's downward facing. You can see him, you know, scooping up or flaring up the sediment, stirring it up a little bit, getting it out of the way. And then what you can't see is he's using his tusks underneath to root up the roots, pull up the roots of the seagrass so that he can eat those. And where's the manatee? She's just cruising along munching on that seagrass. So a little bit, a little bit different. All right. Now that is all that I have to share. Okay. Um, does anybody um, have any questions about any of the marine mammals? Um, Penguins must be birds. Yeah, so penguins would be in a different classification. Um, they would be marine avians, marine birds. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? My personal favorite is the cetaceans. <laughs> I kind of really love them. Love me a humpback whale. Um, false killer whales are really cool. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you all in a future episode of Marine Science with uh, Mermaid Bell. All right. Bye, guys.